Okay, my very first question is, are entrepreneurs born or are they made? Pius will start. <laughs> <laughs> if you're too comfortable in employment, and I mean typical employment, it may not come out. What is the saddest reality of uh, an entrepreneur? You know, best analogy I can give is that one about eagles. You know, eagles fly alone. Welcome to the tea. Uh, on to the question, uh, ask Pius and Solo segment. So where do we begin? <laughs> First question. Yeah? I'd like to thank all of us for this opportunity. My very first question is, are entrepreneurs born or are they made? <laughs> Though I have a series of questions, but that's the beginning one. I, a pious will start. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you can, uh, <coughs> let's lose, use our stories to answer the question. Um, when you look at uh, Solo's story, I see there was no, none of his parents by then were entrepreneurs. In fact, he comes from a family of uh, professors who are very risk averse naturally. Uh, so I, I think Solo was made in the, in the process. We all have these traits. The, we, we were born with these abilities, all of us. But circumstances tend to squeeze out these abilities out of us. So myself too, I, I didn't come from an entrepreneurial background at all. And um, what I do is everything about entrepreneurship. Um, I can't even say I learned it in school, even though I studied uh, Bachelor of Commerce, proper business um, and entrepreneurship. But circumstances and uh, alignment in my places of work brought out all these traits in me. Um, that's how we became an entrepreneur. So anybody can be an entrepreneur. But if you're too comfortable in employment, and I mean typical employment, it may not come out. True. A million percent, I, I agree. Um, you know, the issue of circumstances, I think of them, you know, uh, like toothpaste, you know, a, tooth, a tube of toothpaste. When it's used and there's hardly any left, you know, some of us had a habit of squeezing. You, ap you apply pressure. Yes. That's how I think about those traits. They're deep inside all of us. You know, I, personally, I think human beings, and uh, maybe I should illustrate by sharing this story because it brought it home to me. There's a famous story about uh, some British aristocrats back in the day who, in the gentleman's club, as <laughs> they, they, uh, would happen typically even today if you're in Jugunas or anywhere, there's, there's men gathering. I suspect it happens when women gather too. But uh, in a gentleman's club, these wealthy aristocrats were discussing the issue of uh, challenges, uh, global challenges. The British Empire at the time uh, covered most of the planet. You know, they, they used to say what the sun never set on the British Empire. It was setting somewhere, it was rising somewhere else they controlled. And, and so they were discussing all that comes with us. And one of them, uh, said, you know, no human being has ever summited the Everest. We need to make that possible, you know, for the human endeavor. Mm. And so they went about recruiting people who were interested in this thing. They found a famous explorer. His body was found a few years ago on Mount Everest. I don't know if you guys know about that story. He, he, he was lost up there. Uh, buried in the snow, they just found his frozen body some years back, finally. Famous uh, sort of uh, intrepid type of guy. And they, they told him, we'll fund you, whatever you need for this expedition. You need to summit the Everest for mankind. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what Kipchoge did with the 159 
uh, challenge, right? He was doing it for the advancement of mankind, to show people what's possible. And uh, before they found this guy, they had tried so many other times, so many other times yeah. with failure. Uh, people would go and not come back or give up, come back scared, blah, blah, blah. And, and the story, as the story is told, one of these guys, the aristocrats, uh, before they found the guy who died, uh, looked at, they had a painting of the Everest in, in one of the rooms. And the others were standing around a bit dejected, like this thing, it's becoming expensive and these human beings are not, they're not <laughs> advancing us, you know? Uh, and they say he, he stared at this thing and frustrated, he screamed, you know, very emotionally. And he said, Everest, several times we have tried to summit you. <laughs> and several times you have defeated us. Yes. We have lost our loved ones, men and women we, we, we respect and blah, blah, blah. But I want to tell you something, Everest, you're not growing. We are. Wow. And his point was, we're going to figure it out and we're going to summit you. I mean, how many people have summited Everest today? And, and that's the best way I can answer that question. Anything is possible. Question is, do you want it bad enough? Your surroundings, your circumstances have a role to play in that, like Pius has alluded to, discomfort. Mm -hmm. I actually try as much as possible to be intentionally uncomfortable because I understand that it's in that space of discomfort that I grow. Uh, so, whether it's intentional or forced upon you by other circumstances, for me it was dropping out of college, having to find my way through life and wanting better for myself. Yeah. Um, that sort of pressure brought things out in me I had no clue were in there. Mm. The fortitude, the stick to the never die. Uh, attitude. I'm, I'm a stubborn guy. My, you know, my family will tell you, even my kids. Uh, unfortunately, some of them have taken on that trait. I was playing Monopoly with them last week and I had to curb my emotions because <laughs> they were taunting me and trash talking me the same way I do <laughs> other people. But all these traits we all have. Uh, so are, they, are entrepreneurs made or born I think we all have the ability. Uh, you just need to go after it and, and be intentional. Mm -hmm. Get help also. Surround yourself with other entrepreneurs because those things rub, rub off against you. And you see all of a sudden you, you start to see what's possible. Mm -hmm. It's true. Thank you so much. Taribu. To the next, the very last, and then I pass on the mic. Yeah. Um, I'd like to first recommend you on how you handle your business like it's so efficient. How can a young entrepreneur handle this documentation thing? Like you want to get experience from somewhere or you want to start this business and you're afraid like if I put so much documentation into it somebody may take like I don't trust them. How do we handle trust and uh, detailed documentation of our business like any contract when you want to get employed mm. and then you're like start tomorrow and then there are no contracts to sign like how am, will i be working on which days what hours like what's the pay and everything like what's my scope of duty in this organization how do you handle that because you you want the job yes but, but you, you don't also want, to put want them off. yeah you don't want to sound like you don't trust they will pay you back or anything yeah. how do you handle that detailed documentation on your business yes. like both entrepreneurship and in the corporate world wow i guess i'll start on that one and let pius uh, tie that one off <laughs> and i'm sure he has a lot to say about that so the, um first of all it's an attitude in my view what energy are you bringing to that conversation you, you know what I mean? Uh, I'd rather you stab me with a smile than wi with a harsh face. You know, your attitude is everything. Uh, um, are you asking from a place of fear and 
suspicion and mistrust? Or are you asking from a place of, uh, this is the way it needs to be done. Can we sort out the business kindly? You do it with a smile and a friendly attitude. It's amazing what you can, you can achieve with, with the right attitude, with a friendliness, with an approachability. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, um, a member of staff, I won't, I won't call them out because uh, they have no idea I'm about to say what I'm about to say. But they're very good about, uh, okay, Solomon, you said this is going to happen. Uh, when can I have the contract? They hold me to account. Now, I, as uh, the CEO or the person employing them or engaging them, have a duty to honor their engagement by providing agreements in writing. What we've agreed it needs to be written, otherwise it's meaningless. If I get raptured to heaven tomorrow, who is going to enforce our agreement if it wasn't written? It becomes a question of, oh, Solo said, or Mr. So-and-so said, where's your proof? Mm. Even in a court of law, they'll ask you for documentation. Uh, it's very important. There's no, there's no room for non-documentation, is what I'm trying to say. Mm. But how you ask for it, how you approach it is, is important as well, equally important. So approach it from a place of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? for uh, from a place of due diligence, proper process. Assume, it's a matter of fact. I'll give you an example. Um, yesterday I was negotiating with a lady to buy some land from her in Juja. I'm actually supposed to be meeting with her today. Uh, and she wants X percentage in deposit and uh, balance as quickly as possible afterwards. <laughs> Which I don't blame her. I mean, she's selling the land not because she's bored, she needs money for something. That's why people sell their assets. And understanding that her need for cash now is pressurizing her to try and circumvent due process for me, uh, rather than be confrontational about it, I assumed the due process. And this is how I did it. I said, no problem, uh, Mrs. Whoever, uh, happy to pay you the 10% which will go to escrow uh, by our advocates, right? Which is normal, right? She had no choice but to agree, because that is normal, as opposed to me saying, I'm not paying you, I'm paying the lawyer. So the <coughs> words I use and, and my energy around that conversation could have killed the deal mm. immediately. Mm. Um, I hope that makes, makes sense, yeah. right? So I insisted on, on proper uh, procedure without being confrontational. And I, and I concluded by saying, of course, your balance will be paid out after the completion documents are ready, as is normal, right? Mm. She's like, yeah, right, sour. Mm. So now it's no longer a question of how it's happening. It's when are we starting? Mm. So that would be my advice. Attitude is everything. Uh, I'm one of those guys who strongly believes in, in, in the X factor when it comes to Anything in life, really, because everything in life has to do with other human beings. You have to interact with other human beings to sell them something, to buy something from them, to give them a service, to invest in whatever. Mm. It's human interaction. Mm. People forget that a lot, in, especially in business. You think you can separate the human mm. aspect, yeah. the humanity aspect from... You can't. It's important to be likable. You can't be coming to me with stinky breath. <laughs> Brush your teeth in the morning before you come talk to me. <laughs> Be presentable. Mm. Don't come with egg stains on your shirt. I won't take you seriously. Mm. Uh, basic stuff. So just just be a decent human being and the rest is easy to sort out. That's That, that would be my advice. Thank you. Yeah. Carry you. <laughs> <laughs> Good, thing come, good things come at a price. And when, where money is involved, trust is everything. And tr they say, trust but verify. Ronald Reagan is famous for yes. saying that, yeah. Trust but? Verify. Verify. So if you meet a guy out there 
and he pours all his love to you. And he says, from today we are married, but there is no paper. Can you trust that guy? There's no commitment, right? So the thing is, is if, if someone is committed to deliver something, they are never afraid to put it on paper. And that gives trust to the other party. So it's about, if you say we are going to pay me something, and you agree we put it on paper, then I can trust and expect that it is going to come. But if you just give it to me verbally, uh, yes, I take you for your word, but I have nothing to hold you accountable to that promise. So the thing is, we are talking about business here, and business involves money, and money transacting where there are no documentation is the first sign of fraud or a Ponzi scheme. Problem, always get paid. The only thing <laughs> that we have tried to do as businesses to try and uh, overcome the, the cumbersomeness of doing documentation is technology. So even though you see technology moving really, really fast uh, at the interface where you're interacting with it, behind the scenes, these guys are checking your IDs, they are checking your, they, they are doing so much verification behind the scenes and documenting you, you have absolutely no idea. Today, your biggest data is sitting with uh, the businesses that you seem to interact with them on your phone very conveniently, but they have so much data on you. They trust but verify. They trust but verify. So. If you want to run a business and a, as an entrepreneur and people will trust you, make sure you have the right documentation, not for the sake of documenting, but just for securing everybody's interest, not just yours, but even your customer. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, even Jesus said, it is written. It is written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, on to the second question. Are you ready? <laughs> Uh, hello guys, uh, my name is Eric and my question is, uh, what is the saddest reality of uh, an entrepreneur? And number two, how do you handle risks in business? How, how do, do you handle? handle? Risks. Risks. Risk. Yeah. That's definitely for pious. <laughs> <laughs> I think the... What's the biggest risk you take with entrepreneurship? When you're an entrepreneur, starting a business right now, um, is that you have no minimum. There, you have no flow. You can, you can fall and become worse than where you are today because it involves putting in your own skin in the game. So the biggest risk in, entrepreneur, in entrepreneurship is that you can lose everything. Ev and I mean everything. But that is also compensated by the upside. There is absolutely no limit to your upside. Your upside is... So in, uh, in my world of investment, entrepreneurship is like, is, is like investing in stocks, shares. You, you have no limit downside and you have no limit up upside. Okay, your limit downside is everything you have put in. But your upside is unlimited. And that's why um, the wealthiest people in the world are entrepreneurs. They're entrepreneurs. They took the risk. They risked everything. And the upside more than compensated the downside. The other thing, let me say here. If you are an entrepreneur and you have never lost, then uh, you'll be the first one I've met. Every entrepreneur has lost. You must have the risk. You must have the appetite to fail. Because failure will come, and very soon, and not once, many times, and that's how you will learn to summit to summit the Everest. With every, uh, in my world of investment, what is, I always say, personally, my own personal revelation, every shilling I send out there to invest, it always comes back with a lesson. No matter how many years I've been doing it, it comes back with some lessons that I did not know. Um, so, 
that's the upside. How do you manage risks? The, the, there are ways that we manage risk. Risk. Um, there, there are things, there are some terms, uh, let me mention here, then I explain it. There's something we call stop-loss measures. Stop-loss measures is when you're going into a, a business, you have certain assumptions. Like, for example, the guys who are buying all the COVID materials, masks and all those things, they made certain assumptions before they imported them with containers into the country. Now, if you imported masks with containers, you are assuming you know the world from this point onwards probably will will be in a five year period where everybody will be wearing what a mask. Then uh, two years into COVID, everybody is dropping masks. They are no longer mandatory. The, your assumptions have have changed. So. Your customers, your customer base has, has shrunk so fast that you've, you need to change your business. You need to put a stopgap measure and say, one, I'm not bringing in more shipments. Two, what do I do with the remaining uh, inventory? Uh, that can mean go, go to the hospitals who buy, who, who are your natural customers for these kind of things. If they buy them at one at, a, one at 20 bob, say, I'm selling you at 15 bob, and you clear your stock, uh, get, get hit by the losses, the ones that need to come in, and then you move on, rather than just uh, hide yourself in the house. So that's just one of the mechanism of measuring, uh, managing risk. Yeah. Solo? Hey, I have a million answers to that question. <laughs> um, um, so, in terms of risk, uh, you can never get rid of risk. I mean, risk is, it's, it comes with the territory. Uh, so, just get comfortable with that reality. Number one. Number two, put, put in as many protections as you can, as far as it's up to you. So, for, for me, in my world, it's about our sale agreements, what do they say? Um, I'll give an, a quick example. Uh, just before COVID, we signed a sale agreement to sell some land to a large group uh, of buyers. COVID happened. Government services were shut down. Our sale agreement said, for instance, we, we would have provided all the ownership documents within a space of six months. But then COVID happened, government shutdowns happened. The government shutdown lasted on and off, I think a total of eight or nine months in 2020. And government of Kenya being the largest stakeholder in my business, because they're the ones who produce the documents, we were unable to keep that promise uh, to this other party, to our sale agreement. Now that meant we were in breach, breach of, of contract. And they wanted to ignore that COVID was a, was a real situation. And the reason they could even attempt to do that and, and penalize us, despite the fact that it wasn't our fault, is because our lawyer and ultimately myself at the time overlooked uh, a very common clause uh, which has to do with force majeure situations. Force majeure, it's a legal term, uh, French origin, meaning forces beyond anyone's control. Sometimes they call them acts of God, which I don't agree with. <laughs> uh, God very rarely has anything to do with those acts. But uh, government shutdown is a force majeure situation because of COVID. Not my fault, I can't complete because Ministry of Lands is shut down. But you want to penalize me as if it's my fault. But because the clause was missing, it became a very difficult problem to resolve. Mm. Ever since then, all our sale agreements have a force majeure <laughs> clause. Everything, even letters of offer. <laughs> My lawyer sends me something that doesn't have a force majeure clause like it's a fight. Right? So put in place all the measures you can yes. to mitigate against risk, seen and unforeseen. But uh, at, at some point, you just have to be comfortable with the fact that there is an element of, of potential for loss. 
uh, just today. And I'll, I'll, I know by the time this comes out, it'll be too late, so I'll give you the detail. Just today, uh, as you say yesterday, we were negotiating very aggressively with a land seller uh, who has the craziest uh, payment terms. So our deposit for this transaction is 24 million shillings as a business. A very expensive piece of land. Many other terms and conditions in the sale agreement, but ultimately they want to say, outside of force majeure situations, if you don't complete your processes by a certain date, uh, we are going to cancel the transaction and you lose your 24 million shillings in liquidated damages because of cost of lost opportunity over that period of time for them, which is fair. My financier, the person I'm borrowing the money from, does not like that clause. <laughs> <laughs> because chances are 50-50, that that is likely to happen. Yep. So who is eating the cost? Mm. Who is eating the cost of the 24 million? It became a stalemate. The transaction almost went to pieces. Mm. But just this morning, as I was waiting for Pius to arrive, uh, I had a conversation with my financier. Why? Because I have analyzed that transaction. I know what my upside potential is. Uh, it's almost criminal, to be honest. It, it, it's the multiples are, they keep you awake at night looking <laughs> forward to it. <laughs> like that's how good it is. So uh, I made, a, I made a, uh, a very subjective decision and called my financier and said, listen, if that happens, I'm happy to give you an indemnity and I'll eat the cost myself. I will still return you 24 million, even if they cancel and keep the 24 million deposit. Mm -hmm. And just like that, a transaction that was dead is back on the table. Mm. And uh, what I'm trying to say in that instance is uh, there's no formula. You have to analyze each situation for its own merits. For, for me, it's generally what's the upside, what's the downside? Can I recover from the downside? What other protections can I put in place to cover myself? Uh, especially when they have nothing to do with me. That's all. That would be my advice. And that, that presumes you know you are an expert in the field that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You have to be. Like Pia said, you have to know very often today, uh, and I say it with all due respect, very often today I find myself even schooling our advocates. Because I deal with this so much, I've de dealt with so, so many scenarios, I know things that they haven't dealt with yet. Mm. And that's good. That's where you, we all ought to be in our fields of, of, of practice. You have to be the expert. Mm -hmm. There's no excuses. Because ultimately, the buck stops with you, mm -hmm. period. Uh, so in terms of the saddest reality, that's a very strange question. Saddest reality, I, I can say about entrepreneurship. That was the question, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say the saddest reality for me, in my view, is that it can be very lonely. It's a very lonely uh, process. Um, the journey for me has included leaving groups of friends who did not want to support whatever passion I was trying to pursue. Some become impediments or blockages, even intentionally because they're uncomfortable with what that means. And that ranges from the growth perspective and even after you get there. Um, for me personally, there are friends I started with who as we achieved success were no longer comfortable with our success uh, and I had to extricate myself from those relationships because of the negative energy it was producing. That to me is a very sad reality, that you will lose friends because of success, mm. not failure. Mm. <laughs> like, what the crap is that about? Like, <laughs> if I'm doing well, shouldn't you be happy? Shouldn't we be happy together? But it doesn't always pan out that way. Yeah. Uh, and, and then also from, from uh, just a pure growth perspective, uh, 
you know, best analogy I can give is that one about eagles. You know, eagles fly alone. They, you want to soar like an eagle, just be comfortable with the fact that very often it's just going to be you up there in the storm <laughs> uh, while the chickens are down there hiding in their house. It sounds like a mean thing to say, but it's, it's a reality. And the reason it's sad is that sometimes the, the chickens down there are your family and friends. Um, but you just have to get comfortable with that. That to me is the saddest reality about uh, entrepreneurship. <laughs>